keen to learn more and hear more about these talk series, please um, send your name and contact details to the email address that's on the screen. And that's Southeast Queensland SEQ events at reefcheckaustralia.org. Um, you can also send us a private message in the chat box. You can um, send it to Pablo, to myself, Renee, Jody, or Emily. You can send us a private message with your contact details and your email um, in the chat box and we'll add you to the mailing list. So recent events, in case you guys missed them, um, if you missed the last Coast to Corals, these are the three last Coast to Corals we ha we've had. Um, they've all been online and they've all been recorded. So they're available on Reef Check's YouTube channel. Um, we had light pollution in the marine environment last month with Dr. Ken Wishaw. Um, which was amazing. Jellyfish on the Sunshine Coast by Raylene from the Sunshine Coast Council was amazing, as well as um, the Coast to Cows talk, which is about seaweed supplements for methane reduction from ca cattle. And that was from Professor Nick Paul at USC. That was very cool as well. So those are all available on our YouTube channel. So feel free to go back and give them a watch. Um, events. So tomorrow night at 7.30, I know it's short notice, but we thought it was quite cool. And there will be a shout out for Reef Check um, because we are partnered in working with Your Mates Brewing Company who are in Kiwana on the Sunshine Coast. So they're going to be featured in what's called Crafting a Circular Economy. And this is a talk show that is run by Sunshine Coast Council through their Living Smart program. Um, it's hosted by a gentleman who I'm told is quite good. He's a radio talk show host here on the Sunshine Coast. Um, and they basically just get into... Um, learning about the circular economy and featuring companies and businesses and people on the Sunshine Coast who are trying to advance and progress a circular economy and a waste-free model. So he'll, he'll be talking to um, the owners of Your Mates Brewery and the owners of Waste-Free Solutions, who are both based on the Sunshine Coast, and they'll be talking about some of the ways they've been sustainable, and they're trying to promote a circular economy. So you can tune in um, and live stream on Facebook, or you can visit uh, the Living Smart Queensland website um, and register there. But it's tomorrow night at 7.30, um, and it should be quite good. So definitely encourage you guys to join. Um, we also have our next Bonus Bite series coming up. So these are um, a bit quicker, um, like shortened versions of Coast to Coral. Um, there are mini series of 20 minute online presentations to fill you guys in between the larger Coast to Coral um, scientific presentations like tonight. So um, the, the next one will be on Thursday the 23rd at 6.30 p.m. and it will feature Diana Condolis um, from Plastic Free Places because this month is Plastic Free July. So it's a special one. So if you guys can join, um, that's on the 23rd at 6.30 p.m. Um, another upcoming event is our next Coast to Coral talk series that's in a month from today. This is um, going to be by Dr. Carly Kilpatrick from Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service. She's going to be talking about gray nurse sharks in Queensland. Um, and you can register on the Reef Check website. Um, I have a small note in there about um, the photo that you can see on the poster. That photo was donated to us by the Wolf Rock Dive Center, which was so super cool of them. Um, and I've been told Wolf Rock is the best place to see gray nurse sharks in Queensland. It's at Mexico Devil Island Point. And um, definitely check out the Dive Center. And thank you so much to them for donating that photo for us. Um, so that's, next, uh, that's Tuesday, the 11th of August, same time as tonight so at 6.30 PM. Um, Special shout out. I'm going to let Renee, our ambassador, um, take over and just give a quick mention to Clay Coral. Thanks, Shai. So, uh, Clay Coral is a local Sunshine Coast business um, who make earrings. Um, and she very kindly donates 10% of her profits to Reef Check Australia. So, every month, whatever profit she's made, 10% of that she transfers to Reef Check's trust, which is super generous of her. Um, and we really appreciate her work. Um, as a special for Plastic Free July, Alori is also selling $10 eco tote bags. Um, they're made out of recycled hemp material and she has illustrated a drawing on them. Um, so they're for sale on her website, which is listed there, or you can find her on Facebook. So that's just a little shout out for Clay Coral. Also, anyone who came to our last week, uh, sorry, last month's 
Coastal Coral, we had Ken Wishaw talking about light pollution and the impacts on us and um, other creatures, including turtles and marine life. Um, I caught up with him today and he had some exciting news. So Energex Queensland is responsible for um, well, uh, providing the street lights across Queensland, um, which councils uh, pay for and provide that service to the ratepayers. Um, but Energex Queensland recently added some low light pollution street lights to their inventory, invent, inventory, which councils can choose to use on the street. So that's a massive win for anyone hoping to reduce light pollution on the Sunshine Coast. So what he needs now is for us to support that by contacting our um, elected representatives, so our local councillors, our mayor, um, to let them know that we really want them to make the switch to a, a more friendly lighting option because most of the light pollution comes from street lights. Um, so it's a simple switch that we can make. So in the next couple of days, we are going to um, post something on our Facebook page, which will assist you in making uh, contact with a counsellor. Um, otherwise, you can head to the Sunshine, uh, the Facebook page. It's called Sunshine Coast Astronomy Queensland. Um, and just a few days ago, Ken posted a little um, snapshot of what he wrote to a counsellor. Um, and he's encouraging people to write either the same or a very similar um, blurb to their counsellor um, because they recently had a world record attempt for uh, recording night sky pollution um, and it broke the world record which was super exciting to have the most number of people participating in an online education or sustainability course um, and in doing so they captured a huge amount of data which shows um, light pollution and how it is scattered across uh, the world really and on that um, Sunshine Coast Astronomy Queensland Facebook page there's an interactive map that you can click on and see how light pollution rates on the Sunshine Coast and around us so super interesting so yeah if we can support Ken and the Dark Sky Alliance that would be a nice way for us to um, show his, our thanks to him for the presentation last year and just do something good for us and the environment. Thanks Shai I'll pass it back over. Awesome thanks so much Renee. Um, and we have opportunities like this come up um, fairly often. So if uh, anybody's keen and has time and would like to volunteer, um, shoot us a message in the chat box and we'd love to get you guys in, involved and help you become citizen scientists um, beyond attending our awesome Coast to Coral Talk series and listening to our excellent speakers. So um, let us know if you're keen. So yeah, thanks Renee. Um, so just a couple thank yous. We'd like to thank um, all of our sponsors for these events. Um, all the funding comes from um, these amazing organizations and they help us out in one way or another that helps to host these Coast to Coral Talk series, the ones held on the Sunshine Coast as well as the one in Brisbane um, and Townsville. And so, yeah, thank you very much um, to all of our amazing sponsors and then also to our, all these amazing sustainable companies that provide us with great uh, prizes that we can then put into a goodie bag to send off to our speakers. Um, so Peter can look forward to one of these um, coming to his house soon. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much to all these amazing companies, sustainable brands that are, have donated prizes. Um, yeah. And a thank you especially to all the amazing people and the ambassadors behind the scenes that make these events happen. A lot goes into it. Um, and we've been on the call since 5.30 getting all the tech sorted. And so everybody is awesome. Emily's up there, Jody, our general manager, Pablo, Renee, Julie, and Terry, also all amazing. Um, thank you for everything you do. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker. Um, we have with us tonight Peter Davey, who's going to be talking about the wonderful world of crabs and their diver diversity in southeast Queensland. Um, it goes without saying that uh, Peter is an incredible expert on um, crabs, and I'll just give you a quick background on his work. Um, Peter worked as a curator of Crustacea at the Queensland Museum from 1978 until his retirement at the end of 2018 and served as president of the Australian Marine Conservation Society, where he's now a lifetime honorary member. He's also served as Queensland president of the Australian Marine Sciences Association 
and two terms on the Scientific Advisory Committee for the Fraser Island World Heritage Area. Peter specializes in the taxonomy of crabs and has written and collaborated on 150 scientific papers, four books, and numerous popular articles. These have included the descriptions of over 100 new species, 20 new genera, and two new families of crustaceans. Very cool. So he's also the principal author of the best-selling um, Wild Guide to Morton Bay, the 1998 and 2011 editions. Um, I've been told are amazing and highly recommend. So thank you so much, Peter, for dedicating your time and joining us tonight. Hi, everybody. It's great to be able to talk to you. Um, it would have been more fun in, in person, but um, this is also great. Um, so I've been working on, on crabs of Southeast, well, of pretty much the whole Indo-Pacific, but I certainly started off in Southeast Queensland. Um, and, uh, basically from, from school on, on my holidays and uh, my early earliest years as, as in the conservation. Um, I um, started looking at and looking at crabs and trying to understand what we knew about them for, um, so that we could, you know, pretty much the same sort of work Reef Check's doing now to, uh, to raise the profile of, of crabs and crustaceans as, as important. Uh, ecological um, components of the environment and worthy of saving, particularly with mangroves and, and coral reefs, which is uh, what Queensland's best at, mangroves and coral reefs. Um, crabs are really quite, quite astonishing. Um, they've been part of the consciousness of, of the world for, uh, of humans for as long as, as, as we've been, uh, tribes and societies um, the actual um, we can we can take the the naming of, of crabs back to the Sumerians about um, over 3,000 years ago um, they used to live on this uh, this crab here which called Potamon nedulus which is a, um, a freshwater crab of uh, the Mediterranean region um, and uh, they come out of the water about mid-year, around about the, uh, the around about June, which is and coincidentally the uh, what, what we now astrologically uh, call the, the the Cancer sign, um, and they've rather amazingly um, looked into the skies and and uh, described these stars and, and saw these saw a crab in the in these stars. Um, I could never see it myself, but um, um, but it, if uh, if you look at the uh, the main point of stars, you can you can get some idea of uh, it. It that that constellation marks the northernmost point of the the, the summer solstice in in Europe, and uh, that's when the crabs emerge from the water. Um, the female crabs emerge, and when they're most uh, they're breeding and and um, they've most eaten and and uh, collected back then. So uh, they've in fact called that first crab a lul, which is uh, so that would be the first I think the first recorded name for a crab in in human history. Um, more recently, in, on a more scientific level we've we've had the crab nebula named in 1840 which does indeed look more like a crab and uh and the southern crab nebula for us which um, back in 1967 which again looks much more like a like a true crab um aristotle was the first one to name in in modern times the first one to name crabs as part of a his naturalist studies, and um, he described about 12 species of crabs that can still be recognized today. But um, there's been a lot of work done since, and um, so, so the, there's now around 7,200 species of crabs um, in the world, um, and more being named. Um, of those, about 1,000 uh, occur in Australian waters. And uh, and again, 
about 300 from from Moreton Bay, which is which is pretty fair. About a third of all the species in Australia occur in southeast Queensland. Um, they range from very very tiny. This little, little false spider crab. Um, this is actually a, a new species that uh, I haven't described yet, but it's um, it that's full size and it lives in fresh waters. And there's there's a new one from the Sunshine Coast, and a new one from from Stradbroke Island. Um, you probably won't be able to find it if you go looking, but um, they're quite difficult to find. Um, uh, then actually the, that is the smallest known crab that is mature um, and is a, able to, has a smallest recorded breeding size for, for a crab and it's a species I described from North Queensland and it's at 1.8 millimetres um, carapace size. So you go from that to this one here, which is the giant southern crab um, from southern southern Australia, which is indeed the largest or arguably the largest crab in the world, um, which gets to nearly 18 kilos in weight. And uh, and this major claw is um, the size of your uh, um, human forearm. Um, so they're, they're very, very diverse uh, in, in shape and, and form. So um, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of idea about how they how they how they breed and a bit about their life cycle. This is um, the well-known blue swimmer or sand crab. Um, crabs often will court. Um, this one is uh, is they have different strategies. This this one is uh, is a male crab courting a, a female crab. They often will will catch them like this and and hold them until they molt. Um, some crabs like to, to molt while the female's um, soft and uh, more cuddly, I guess. Um, whereas other ones um, will mate uh, from, from hard, with the hard shells. So when she molts uh, and is ready to, to mate, the, 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 she gets rolled over and the, the the structures in, under the abdomens um, uh, inserted into her thorax or under into her sternum, uh, where the the eggs, uh, 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 the sperm actually fertilise the eggs. Uh, eventually, she'll bury up like this, called berry, which is um, an ovigerous crab bearing lots of eggs. Uh, and then when the eggs hatch, they flex the abdomen and, and let the spawn go. Pretty much, can look pretty much like coral spawning. Um, and depending on the, the type of crab, there can be, there can be like a mud crab can have up to 6 million eggs in one, one female at one spawning. So um, they're pretty amazing. So once they once they reach uh, the eggs hatch into the water, there's a number of molt sta stages which look nothing like crabs. Um, so they metamorphose through up to five usually mart larval stages. Um, each each one they live in the plankton and eat eat uh, phytoplankton and other and other um, other zoological plankton that's floating around in in the upper layers of the water. And then finally, um, when it's time to settle out, um, they turn into this megalopa, which is the, the stage where it, the tail starts to get short and it, it drops to the bottom and, uh, and, and starts to take up a, a bottom dwelling existence. Um, that then molts into what looks like a juvenile crab, the first crab stage, and, and then keeps molting until it it uh, reaches the adult size, and that can be anything from uh, from six months to three years to ten years to get to fully adult size. Um, so this is this is a molting sequence. Um, 
this typically the the crab molts by separating the top of the carapace from the from the bottom and the legs and then walking out backwards um, it also be prior to that it absorbs its calcium and um, and um, keeps that in reserve for hardening the shell again when it when it's uh, when it's when it's come out when it when it first molts you might have caught a a crab at the you know a mud crab or a sand crab sometimes they're soft um, it's usually because they've just molted um, and they take about 24 hours to harden up at which time they're quite vulnerable so they'll hide away and under rocks or whatever shelter they can find to, before they they harden up um, so they have special suture lines and everything in that shell including the eyes and, and everything is is uh is comes out it's it's quite quite astonishing so i'm going to um try and go through this in a somewhat ecological way somewhat uh, my favorite bits um it's a, it's a bit a little bit random but it sort of all makes sense i think so i've called it a crab for all occasions um So when I first started working on crabs, it was uh, in the mud and um, and intertidal crabs, and they're they're quite special. Um, crabs living intertidally uh, have a lot of it's a, it's a very harsh environment. They've only got six hours or so to uh, to feed and to mate and to to um, uh, display to each other and and uh, and it's it's hot and it's cold and it's it's sunny and the, the they're out of the water so they're they're they're, um, they're up against it um, then they've got to go down and, and sit in the mud in their burrows for another 12 hours until uh, until the tide comes around um, but the, the first crabs that ever really grabbed my imagination were the fiddler crabs. Um, these are only, a, only well, they're only uh, about, a big one could be the size of your, of your finger, probably. Um, and the males of the fiddlers have these large, large claws, um, which are used to display to the females. Um, this, this, these small ones here are the only ones that the males use for um, for feeding, and um, they just scrape the mud into their into their mouth parts. Um, so they call them fiddler crabs because they're um, the the they have a waving pattern which is specific to each species, um, and they can rec the females recognise the males according to the way they they behave. Um, and the way why they they dance with their claws, um, so it's quite complex social behaviour, um, and and they also the males also fight with each other using the claws by having pushing battles. Um, these long eyes uh, are quite astonishing physiologically. They've got three hundred and sixty degree um, vision. So they can they can see anything coming from any 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 direction. They can they've got uh, different focal lengths according to the to the cornea the where the, so um, looking straight out the front they their focus focal distance is it's a bit like multi-focus glasses. Their focal distance is on on the other crabs around them, and then as they move up to the top of the eye, their their horizon changes so that they can pick up. Uh, birds flying and, and predators coming in. Um, so they're able to uh, to get out of the way very quickly. And if you're ever in a mangrove situation or a muddy shore, um, the moment the moment you arrive, they'll be down, the, down their burrows. But if you sit quietly and just don't move, they'll come up again and carry on their business. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a great alternative to bird watching in my in my mind. So they're they're uh, 
each each crab has a, has a different color patterning, um, and they change colors with with the season and with their um, time of day and and uh, and even whether they're ready for due for mating or mating condition. Um, so they they're quite complex. Uh, behaviorally and physiologically. This one, Yucca longa digitum, is actually uh, a native species just to southeast Queensland. It's the only place it's found, and it goes from Moreton Bay to about to about Noosa. Um, typical, not 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 the most spectacular. It's a sort of grey, grey and white claw, but uh, but it's our own. This is related to the fiddler crabs, or it appears to be related to the fiddler crabs, but it's actually got the two large claws, similar long eyes and similar carapace shape. But um, this is actually an endemic family, which has only got the one species in it. It's really quite distantly related, and it's an example of, of convergent evolution, where they uh, are living in the same environment with the fiddler crabs, but having a different ancestor, but it, it's now converged to look much like much like fiddler crabs. They also wave, but they use both both claws at once, um, and they can change in colour from from uh, quite a fawn um, pale orange through to this dark purple when they when they when they mature. Um, also out more out on the mud flats and in the in the low tide level you get this other these other species they're all got these long eyes they're all sort of related to each other in their different families but um uh from the fiddler crabs but they're they again they've got these long eyes so that when they it's especially for living in burrows as well when they put their the first thing you see when coming out of the burrow is the tips of their tips of their eyes peeking around and checking out the scene. Um, uh, and again, they they just they they work their way through the mud and just eat eat mud pellets. This little guy is uh, is another endemic to Australian species. Um, and it's uh, it's 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 only about the size of your, your fingernail, and most people do, don't see it. But when you get down close, it's got these beautiful purple claws and uh, lovely little white white face. And yeah, it's, it's a gorgeous little crab. It's one of my favourites. And of course, the iconic soldier crab. The um, these are. I have to say these probably are my my total favourite. Um, I've described several species from outside Australia. The one in in Australia is is quite well known. It's been described for a long time. But um, so they march uh, across the shore, which is what everybody knows. Um, whoop! Go okay, back one. They um, they have an interesting way of feeding in that they have this big um, swollen mouth parts, so they're, they're globular shape. They um, they use their claws to scoop the sand into the into the mouth, and that's then they pump water through the sand, and the water circulates and and filters out. Um, tiny little um, micro animals um, in, and algae and so on growing in the in the sand and nutrients and they use all these little um, furry seedy or hairs in the mouth to 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 grab the the nutrients and the little organisms and and that's what they swallow and then they spit out the um, the sand in these little balls so that they they're not eating the same sand over and over. They're always going for new sand. Otherwise, uh, there wouldn't be enough to, uh, just to, to sustain them. Um, and they only come out for about uh, two or three hours uh, at the bottom of the tide. And, um, and then 
when you when you go on the beach, you'll see these little characteristic uh, mounds of of sand. So what what they're actually doing is feeding under the ground. While they're out on the surface, they seem to be mostly being social and um, <clears throat> probably finding finding new uh, checking the ground to make sure and find new uh, nutrient rich areas that um, that are going to be best for feeding. And then they um, they go underground and they tunnel along just under the ground feeding and that's called their feeding phase um, and uh, and then they disappear uh, they can burrow corkscrew down very quickly into the sand that you probably hopefully you all you all know them very well but uh, they're wonderful little crabs so um, has anyone got any questions at this point if you have, just just um, just just ask, and we can we can pause and stop as we go along. I think a couple of questions may have come through, Pablo. If you have a second, yes, I did get a few. Um, the first one would be: uh, Are the large claws on fiddler crabs used for defence at all, or just dancing? <clears throat> um, they are used for defence. Um, well. A bit of both. They use for fighting, um, so yeah. There's usually one has to defend when the other one's being more aggressive, I guess. But um, <laughs> so maybe they're so they 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 do have they do have territorial fights and they fight over the females. Um, they they tend to uh, to lure the females once they get the interest of the female. They they lure her back uh, to their burrow. Um, uh, so at that point other males can can uh, can get in on the act and have to be pushed away and so on so yeah well thank you for answering that one um, another one would be is Australia the country with the most number of crab species and is having 300 different species in Moreton Bay significant or average for a region normally um, it's significant. Um, I think, well, uh, first part of the question, a thousand species for Australia out of 7,000 in the world is, uh, is pretty, is a pretty high percentage. Um, a lot of Australian species are um, indigenous or endemic to Australia. They've evolved here because of the history of the Continental drift and the breakup of Gondwana and and so on. Um, so a lot of crabs in Australia have uh, have evolved here, and then as as we've drifted north into uh, into Asia and New Guinea, and and uh, the Indian Ocean was closed off from the Pacific. A lot of the uh, more northern species have have come down into Australia and particularly into tropical Australia. So. We've got a mix of our own endemic fauna and then a lot of the tropical uh, species that have, have come down from the north. So that, that has increased the number of species in Australia probably more than, than many other countries. Um, and Moreton Bay and Southeast Queensland generally has very high diversity because we're right on a, on a biogeographic over, overlap zone. Um, we get the um, we get both tropical and uh, subtropical temperate species. So the things that like the colder water come up as far as Moreton Bay and uh, and then sort of cut out. And then a lot of tropical things are coming down from the from the East Australian Current and the reefs, and they tend to stop at about Moreton Bay because past there we don't tend to have so many uh, good reefs and the mangroves peter out and uh, the habitats become less complex. So yeah, Morton Bay is a special place for crabs and, and just about every other animal actually, every other animal, marine animal group. Um, I've got one from Wendy Fletcher. Um, do all crabs walk sideways? That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, that's a famous one. Um, no, they don't. Uh, there was an old joke about the crab walking straight when he was drunk, but um, um, actually crabs 
the crabs, um, it, it, it depends on the, on the type of crab and the, and the, um, uh, the habitat it's living in. So some, it, it, it changes the shape of their body and the way their, their legs interact. So a lot of the ones you'll see into tidally will uh, have, have, are able to, to run quickly because they, they're, uh, they need to get out of the way of, um, of predators or um, birds or whatever. So they, they tear off down a burrow as fast as they can. And um, so they tend to be, that, that design is best for, uh, for fast running. Other crabs uh, will just move whichever way they want, whenever they want. Um, and uh, it's, yeah, it's not, not uh, it's a bit of a, it's true that crabs um, move sideways, but it's not universal. Okay, um, I've got one personally. What's the difference between tropical, subtropical and cold water species crabs like the king crab in Norway? Like the king crab? King crab, yeah. What's the difference? Um, uh, well, um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult it's a complicated question, that one. Um, the tropics, uh, like anything else, uh, uh, has has more complicated and more complex environments, more complex habitats, reefs and mangroves, and 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 just generally, you know, warm is good. People, things grow quickly. They can feed quickly. They 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 uh, they grow quickly. Uh, so they often have shorter shorter generation times um, and basically they can evolve quicker I think because of that um, so the tropics um, uh, generally for it well, for all animals uh, have a, a much higher uh, diversity than than the cold water ones um, cold water species are usually specialized um, um, they're able, they're able to um, well, they just don't like not <laughs> warm water, um, and that they gr often grow quick, grow more slowly, and um, uh, and are special, just specialised um, to that environment because every any any available environment will be colonised by by any sort of uh, animal that wants to to live there. Um, but it's because it's cold and because things. Are slower to grow and turn over times so they tend to live longer so things like the the Norway crab um, they can they can get to to huge numbers um, important fisheries and so on um, but they, they're living on uh, on different food sources often the the ecology of cold water is, is quite different from the ecology of of, uh, of warm water it, it's, Bit too complicated to get to get too much more into it than that, I'm afraid. So, yeah, that's okay. Thanks for answering such a complex question. Um, another one from Julian. How much do we know about crabs in the tropical areas of Australia in terms of diversity? Um, we uh, we we're still learning. When we're still, it, it's it's changed a lot um, even in the last in my lifetime with when I first started in crabs the we really didn't know very much about them at all um, that was one of the one of the things I took I took our local mangrove crabs into the museum to help them get identified before I worked there and um, basically there wasn't very much in the way of resources to identify identify them at all um, taxonomy has, has always been done in dribs and drabs and, um, and it's probably, uh, it always depends on who, on who's, who's working and who's interested. So, um, since, um, the seventies from the seventies through to, to the, 
to the 2000s has been a boom time for taxonomy in a lot of ways because we've had a lot of technological changes and computers and digital photography and it's been a lot more efficient to to uh, to describe things and and a lot easier to get to a lot of places to to do the, the field work to find the things um, so there's been a lot of a lot of work but there's still many new species across northern Australia um, and I'll, I hope to uh, to describe many more before I go to the great crab in the sky. Uh, I'm sure you will. <laughs> um, another one from Wendy, are all crabs vegetarian? No, no they're not. So that's that's something we'll 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 move on in in the rest of the talk. So uh, so I might um, move on at the moment. Um, this is brings up this current slide. There are a lot of um, vegetarian crabs in the mangrove systems, um, and some of them can get quite large. This this one is uh, is a local species. Um, which is about the size of your hand. Um, it's called the scarlet three-spine mangrove crab. It's actually one of one that I described. Um, it, it was known before um, before I found it. Uh, I didn't find it new, but it was was confused and called a different name. Um, it was it was called a name from a, a species that lives in Asia, um, and it's it's a different different species. Once we looked at it closely, we realized it was different. Um, so what, what crabs are really, really very important to, to mangrove systems. Um, they, they burrow down into the, in, especially in around the roots of the, of the mangrove trees. Um, um, and this takes, um, fresh water down amongst the roots it aerates the aerates the water into the into the uh, to the base of the trees um, fresh water and and because the because of the consistency of the mud you're always getting um, hydrogen sulfide um, and uh, anoxia which lack of oxygen in the in the in the sediment um, so the crabs actually uh, are crucial in bringing oxygen down into the into the, the muddy sediments and um, and helping the whole um, growth of everything pretty much except for anaerobic bacteria um, and when they do that they're eating the leaves that are falling out of the trees here um, and uh, and they're they're pooing out um, um, organic matter for other things to eat they're, they're taking the the leaves down into the into the burrows for the for the for the other organisms, the bacteria and the, the fungi and so on to 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 live on, um, and just generally creating an environment that is 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 rich and uh, and uh, productive for a whole suite of other other species. And, and for the health of the, the mangroves themselves. Um, so take the, take the crabs away. Um, it's, it's really, you would really uh, notice a significant um, decline in the health of the mangroves. And of course, uh, all this important uh, recycling of energy by the crabs is then washed out into the creeks and and becomes part of the, the network of the food um, um, for the for the prawns and the and the small fish and 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 the other things living in the in the coastal waters. Um, this 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 whole group is uh, it's called the mangrove mangrove crabs or the it's, it's this family called the Sasamidae, and. Um, they're very special because they have a, a special system on the sides of the front of the carapace here, which is a whole network of little, um, little hairs that, that protrude down. And um, the thing with being in mangroves is, is that 
if you're going to be running around in out of the water, you can't. You're having problems with with um, a gills that need need air. Um, you can't breathe in the. You're normally designed to breathe in water. Um, so they 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 have air and they have water, but the water is often not not high quality. So they take the water in through pouches around the base of their legs. Um, they pump it up through the mouth parts. And then it comes down in a fine film across the, the front of the shell here. And what, when it, it's in that form, it, it is absorbing the oxygen out of the air. It's then getting picked up, pumped back through the, through the, uh, the base of the legs and back into the gills. So, so they've got a whole system for, um, for, for staying out of the water as long as possible and recirculating the, their, um, the water in their the oxygenated water through their through their gills, um, amazing. Rebreathing system. Um, this one's a, a very very common ubiquitous sort of uh, species that you find just about everywhere. It, it 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 eats just about everything. It'll eat it'll eat scrape algae and eat algae when it's if algae is all that there is, or it'll scavenge, or it'll it'll actually um, predate as well, um, and uh, it's uh, a very successful little crab. Um, this one uh, is an, is in the same group, but it lives on the rocky shores, um, and it it is strictly vegetarian. Um, it it it's um, it just scrapes the the algae off the rocks. You can tell rough, roughly, well, pretty pretty accurately what a crab will eat by the structure of its claws. Um, so the crabs that that uh, that eat eat algae and and veg vegetation tend to have um, instead of having sharp pointed claws, they have sort of scrape scraper like hoof like claws that are that with sharp edges that they use to to drag and cut the algae off the off the rocks or, or scrape it or, um, or or more scissor like sort of action um, and that's most of these shore crabs are like that um, these are rocky shore ones um, mostly they eat algae but um, they will eat. They'll eat anything that uh, that comes within their their grasp usually. Um, but they're not active predators. But they will eat um, anything that's dead or anything that takes a, gets too close. Um, these these shore crabs are are different because they they don't they don't recirculate the air. The ones on the rocky rocky shores because they can. They can run down into the into the fresh sea water quickly, and get more water when they when they as they need it. Um, and they have these the the claws are designed and the the way the claws are designed they can lock themselves into uh, into crevices uh, in the rocks. They're flattened so they can get into into holes and crevices. Um, and so they're also because they, that means when the waves come they don't they're not getting washed away. Um, and if there's a predator like a human trying to grab it and pull it out, they they can lock everything against the the rocks and and almost impossible to shift. Um, and some of them are really pretty. This is um, an agile shore crab. It's 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 actually one that you tend to find just subtidally on the rocky shores, under rocks and things, but. Um, Really, really pretty little things. They're vibrant um, colours when you see them. You just, you just um, go, wow, what was that? Because they, they they move very quickly too. Long legs, big spines on the legs again. That helps protect them from uh, from predators and and locks them into the rocky shore, rocky habitats. Um, so then. If we're more moving more into um, 
different lifestyles. You get um, another popular group is other the animals like sponge crabs, things that live with other with other with other animals. So there's uh, these are called the decorator crabs, um, and they're not. They basically they they're designed. The shells are either they're either evolve um, so that they mimic um, other where the habitat that they're living in. So this one, the arrowhead crab, Huenia, is uh, it, its shell looks like a, um, a a halameda, which is green algae, uh, thick, broad-leafed green algae, and it lives amongst the green algae. Um, and it actually sometimes the algae grows on it on it as well. Um, so it has has um, frond-like shape. Um, so it it camouflages itself in in its habitat, whereas the decorator crabs actually plant themselves with with the environment they they find bits of sponge and they they actually garden and put it on their backs and grow the grow the sponges and and other and other things on their backs um, they're little little hooked sharp little hooks um, seaty a bit like velcro which which they um, they hook the the sponge into until it grows. This one, this picture is a little bit blurry, which doesn't help. But, but this is actually um, a decorator crab, um, one of the the more spectacular ones. It it has a particularly fine eye for for um, for for different things. So this particular species has very long legs. The so the the actual legs come right out here, and these are the claws coming around. There's the eyes there. And the the front it's sort of triangular shaped, and it's 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 planted itself with algae and sponges and and um, other algae and mycidians and and you you just can't see them until they move. Um, amazing, beautiful little creatures. Well, actually, they get to dinner plate size these ones. And then there's the sponge crabs that. Uh, that actually hollow out a, a piece of, of sponge or um, sometimes sea squirts, colonial sea squirts, and they they have special uh, back legs that are designed to, to hold this little cap in place. So this one's roll over on its back, um, and uh, when you if you you can find these on the headlands if you turn over the rocks at at, um, at Caloundra, for example, sometimes you'll you'll see them. Um, often only small, but there's 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 one that you get out diving off off Cook Island and and the Little Bar and so on, which is which is um, quite quite massive um, and uh, very big globular thing. I haven't actually seen the the um, sponge they carry, but um, probably because I don't recognize them unless they've they've lost their sponge but um so there's these things species that carry camouflage around with them um and they ha they they have these special like this this one here is not a sponge crab but it's a related group and um again they have these last two pairs of legs that have little little hooks little claws on the on the back pair of legs and this one carries mangrove leaves around on its back, um, and other ones will carry. You know, different species will carry different things. They're called carrier crabs. Um, even even large sea urchins sometimes. Um, and uh, yeah, both form of protection and and um, and and camouflage. And then you get ones like this that are just. Um, uh, this is actually uh, another triangular shaped crab here, very big warty claws, um, little legs sort of tucked in. Uh, you get these. I've found these on the on the local reefs. Again, quite a large crab, um, 
and just covered in in gunk really they're not they're not decorating they're just the whole shape of the of the of the crab the surface of the crab is covered in little bumps and tubicles and and um and accumulates to just accumulates whatever's whatever's around and it just merges into the background uh, sort of pause there for a moment if anyone wants to ask things um, i hope i'm not going to go too long anyway i've got a couple questions lined up um so first one from johanna where do you draw inspiration for naming species ah uh, it's always it's always a, a tricky one um people often say you name it after yourself but uh, you, you don't the etiquette is never to name something after yourself um but a species name always has a full citation for a species always has the author and date which is like a reference for the for the species so someone knows where to look up the original paper um so uh that's one of the perks of being a taxonomist your name lives on with the species you describe um there's no hard and fast rule um you can name it uh to reflect some something special about the crab so um so for example this is a, a ghost crab it's called ceratophthalmus um serato means stalk and ophthalmus is to do with the eyes so it's 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 a latin meaning stalked eyes so um th this particular crab is um is is named after its most obvious characteristic um has stalked eyes so they turn that into latin and call it ceratophthalmus um but you can you can name it after your uh colleagues that you think have done good things you can you can name it according to its color um, you can name it from the from the place that it was found so if it was found on morton island you can call it mortonensis um, you can use um, indigenous names you can use um, pretty much whatever you want um, as long as it's not rude or <laughs> being uh objectionable to anybody uh, which some people have tried but, uh, but <laughs> thanks um, for that one um we'll move on to the next how far can crabs travel do they stay in the same place and add into that one uh, kaylee asked that question and johanna wanted to add to that one saying how does that affect species dispersal in local areas how does that affect a uh, species dispersal like dispersal of species um, distribution. Crabs don't tend to, they, they tend to have short range migrations. Um, so some crabs will migrate from, from the mangroves or down to, or up, up into fresh water. So there's one, um, one species that you get around here, which migrates up into fresh water um and then comes down back to the to the coast to to spawn um distribution is mostly by um by the larvae so the larvae uh, are usually um marine and they float around so they'll they'll move up and down the coast as larvae and then settle out in new areas so um it, it's it's something that is is quite interesting with with potentially with climate change and um, and warming warming oceans. Um, we're starting to see some species turning up further down um, the east coast now than they used to be. Um, uh, there's a, a a species of um, shrimp that um, freshwater prawn that is is now being found in cans about 200 kilometers south of where it used to be so um climate change and and warming oceans is 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 an important uh consideration in um in distributions 
but they don't tend to have long, you know, long migrations um, as adults. Okay, thanks for that one. Um, another one from Johanna. Uh, life cycles of male female uh, crabs different, and does it affect the genetic diversity? Um, they generally, generally not. Um, you can have different. Um, different sex ratios, sometimes more females than males. Sometimes you get, uh, often you get sexual dimorphism, um, which means that males and females can look quite different. Um, and that's in with the fiddler crabs, it's a good case. So the males who you can immediately recognize because of the big claws. Um, some females will get much larger than the males. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a good example of that in a, in a GIF. Um, so I'll, I'll move on slightly. Um, these are the, the species that live in the sand. Um, we get two species of, of ghost crabs here. This is Theratophthalmus, which I just talked about with the long eye stalks. That lives down on the beach, um, down close to the water. And then up up behind the beach on the on the sand dunes where, where you camp, you get this this other one, the smooth handed ghost crab. Um, most people uh, see this one as as tiny little ones scooting around on top of the sand dunes, leaving little trails. Um, kids love trying to catch them, but they they're very 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 fast. Um, the uh, these ones here, uh, there's been a lot of work done on the Sunshine Coast by um, uh, Professor Schlacker out at um, uh, Sunshine Coast Uni on the impact of, of four-wheel drives on their habitat because they um, this, the four-wheel drives compact the sand and, and make it difficult for them to burrow, plus, plus can crush them um, in their burrows and so on. Um, so... Uh, they're, they're quite. They're, they're very important for beach ecology. They're and they they're a good clean up squad. They eat any anything that comes ashore. Um, in more tropical waters, they they eat baby turtles and things, which is a bit naughty of them. But um, you know, we've all got to live. Um, the other the other crab that you get um, around through this area is this sand bubbler. Um, People probably mostly see the the um, the result of the sand bubbler crabs, which is these um, little rows of pellets coming out from from a little burrow. So the crab actually looks like this, um, and you can see on the back legs it has these big flattened um, uh, panels on the back legs. And they used that they 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 call tim, timpani um, or tympan, tympanum, which is uh, named after an eardrum. And they they used to think that they they could hear through these um, um, flat panels of thin cuticle, but it it now turns out that they actually can breathe uh, breathe uh, oxygen through the through the cuticle on their, these panels. Um, which is another different adaptation for for living in oxygen and uh, sort of almost having lungs on their legs. Um, very strange. Um, but talking about um, making sound, some crabs do make sound, and um, these ghost crabs have uh, have a behind this main claw. They have a, a, a row of um, fine ridges which they rub against the the orbit um which is the bottom of the eye socket here and um that actually makes quite a loud quite a loud sound particularly if you're another crab um so they can communicate across quite quite some up to 100 or 20 or 30 meters across across the beach um with other crabs um and to to let them know they're there or uh, 
or fine females or you know they're quite sophisticated and they have they have quite complicated methods for hearing too which i'm not going to go into but um so they they become very sophisticated um living intertidally much more so than we would think so this is this is part of that question about males and females um said in the arms of of another um these these species um are ones that live in live in uh in cons in mutualism or symbiosis with other species um this one's a xenia crab this they always found living with the soft coral xenia um the harlequin crab often is usually found living with um Holotherians, sea cucumbers. Um, you get the this pea crab that lives inside razor razor clams. Um, and with the pea crab and and the next one I'm going to show you, they the females are very large and uh, live inside a protected environment, whereas the male is is usually a tiny, a tiny little dwarf male. Um, and it it it's free living, and it 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 moves between the um, between the habitats where the where the female is basically um, living at home, and it 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 mates with them within that and within that enclosed shape. Um, there is another good example of that. Um, that I'll show you in a sec. This one is is a is a called a boxer crab. Um, this one's a harlequin boxer crab. It actually carries anemones around in its claws, and it uses those as defence. It uses them to box it, box um, uh, defence against predators. The 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 anemone actually has quite nasty little sting. Um, it uses it to box other crab other male crabs, um, and and defend its territory and um, the the really interesting thing about it is that if it loses one of these anemones from one of the claws it actually will will um, cut the other anemone in half and and grab it with its claw and it it actually um, a it's it's tool use which is um, something that you don't normally associate with lower animals and b it's 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 actively cloning its 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 pet an enemy um so it it's it's taking an, an enemy cutting it in half and regrowing it in its other claw because it's often quite difficult to find these anemones um growing growing in, uh, away from the crabs um, so they can't afford to lose them and then we get into a whole um the whole group of, of crabs that live in corals. Um, these are called guard crabs. Um, they're actually very important to coral ecology. They 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 stop any they they quite fiercely guard things, the snails and and echinoderms and anything trying to eat the coral polyps. And then the coral provides a very good refuge for them to hide in. Um, this was the other the other one that has a dwarf male. This is a coral gall called gall crab. So the female makes a irritates the coral. And this is mostly in coral called Possilopera. It uh, irritates the the coral to grow around it, and um, and it makes a little cage and a little hole inside where it lives um, with little holes to come out. And the, the males can actually get inside. The, the crab itself, the female crab is trapped in there. The male can come in and, and mate with it. And then the, there's enough room there for the eggs to be released. Um, so the female is always protected, um, but, and it just eats coral mucus. Um, Pretty boring life, but you know, safe. So there's, there's, there's. Um, I'm going to go a bit long on this talk, so um, I'll try and run through it quick, fairly quickly. 
these are the 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 uh, swimming crabs. These are ones that you can tell are active predators. They're the they're the nasty ones that that you know will really you can tell by the claws. They've got very sharp cutting cutting teeth on the claws, long pointed fingers, um, and they've got paddles on the last pair of legs which they use to swim and they can swim very quickly so that's a this is a blue swimmer and they come in various forms um, this one's uh, um, the hairy swimming crab lives around coral and, and under rocky rocks and, and um, snags um, and comes up in pots every now and then it's common enough uh, museum and quarry about what it is and whether you can eat it and yes you can um, you can pretty much eat any of the swimming crabs. Um, the um, one of my big studies at the museum was to work on the sand crabs, and uh, the when I travelled elsewhere in the in the region, I had found that other crabs didn't quite look like ours. Uh, other sand crabs, they were all used to be called Portunus pelagicus, um, blue swimmer or sand crab right through Asia. So we started doing a, an, a study with the Singaporeans, uh, university in Singapore, and they were doing the genetics. And we've, we looked at them from right throughout the, the region from the Indian, Western Indian Ocean through to, um, up to Japan and, and the Pacific, and it turned out there's actually four different four different species, even though they all look very similar. Um, they tend to have different uh, colour patterns, and uh, and the Australian one uh, is actually uh, unique to Australia, and it's the easiest one to identify because it's got four spines on its the front of its claw here. Um, but they'd been They'd, funnily enough, they'd all had names, so it didn't have to come up with any new names, but they'd all been lumped together since since the 1700s. Um, when they first started describing them, um, the first species was in 1758, 1775, 1799. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a very well-known species, but for, for the last 200 years or 150 years, we've always thought it was just one species and it wasn't. It was actually four different species and they each have different ecologies and different breeding strategies. And, uh, and if you're managing the fishery, for example, it's really important to know. And in Australia, we get this one, but we also get Portunus pelagicus coming down from Asia, but that's only in, in the sort of Darwin region. Um, so it's it's something that you know modern techniques using genetics particularly and 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 a broader broader study is uh, is able to show us now that things are not as uh, are much more complicated in terms of diversity than we used to think um, and even in Australia the color color pattern can range quite a lot but the the essential um, the the colors can arrange, can differ a lot but the pattern of the of the spotting and the striping is 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 consistent. And I'd, I'd earlier done a similar study on on the mud crabs, and uh, the same story with that. We we found that there were actually four species of mud crabs, not not one that we'd previously thought. Um, and some of the swimming crabs. That's talking about convergent evolution. This this one. This one you get in southern Morton Bay, or in Morton Bay and in southern Queensland sometimes. Um, comes up, it's an inquiry into the museum, has very, very long eyes, which is really strange for a swimming crab. Um, but it lives in burrows and it, 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 it works much similar to the, to the shore crabs. It puts its, its eyes up and checks out for predators. Um, This one is uh, a box crab, which is a really uh, cool animal that you get. You 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 can collect around uh, southeast Queensland. It's it's amazing is that it's got this special hook on here, and it eats gastropod snails. It hooks it hooks the uh, 
the shell, the coil shell in there, and then it just peels it away and breaks the breaks the uh, breaks the shell open, and then uses this other claw to uh, to pick out the pick out the snail once it can get at it. Uh, I'll just there's a lot of a lot of crabs on the reefs around here. A lot of pretty pretty colours, pretty shapes. Um, and a couple of them, uh, I just have to have a warning that don't don't eat anything you don't know. Um, some of these can be really toxic, um, uh, particularly around the reefs. Um, uh, the atagatus that you get around here and the zosimus, they can have uh, tetrodotoxin, palytoxin, saxitoxin, which is, you know, very, very toxic uh, uh, chemicals. And that we not, I don't think they've killed anyone in Australia because Australians don't eat them much, but they have been responsible for killing people overseas um, that have made soup out of, the, out of them and so on. Um, so they don't necessarily, they don't, they're not intrinsically toxic, but they eat, um, they eat what they eat tends to make their flesh very toxic. So, spanner crabs, it's uh, still a successful fishery off Queensland um, and it's, it's, it's been, it's well managed and it, it's, uh, it appears to be uh, a very well managed fishery and it's one, you know, I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, very strange, strange looking beast. Um, they often come ashore in their, in their thousands for, on, onto sandbanks for mating. Um, anyway, yes, that's the end. Thank you so much for that presentation, Peter. Uh, the feedback and chat in the, the group chat has been incredible. And there are lots of questions, so I'll, I'll jump straight into them. Um, first one would be, what's the average lifespan of a crab, which was asked from Andrea? Um, it 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 varies a lot. Um, some some can can grow. Some can la can can be fifty years old, particularly the cold water ones. Um, uh, and they they grow slowly and live a long time. Um, other ones can can be less than a year. Um, it depends on a lot. It it's often the the colder water the the longer they live often. Um, for mud crabs, for example, um, will reach uh, maturity in in about 12 months to 18 months in the tropics, but down in Queensland, down in this area, it might take three years to um, to to get to full size. Um, so all of that depends, um, you know, it impacts on how long they live. Okay, thank you for that one. Um, are crabs heavily afflicted, affected sorry, uh, by plastic pollution? Ah, very good question. I, 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 there has, uh, to my knowledge, there's been no study of it, but um, that would make a really interesting study because the, the fine, um, particularly the nanoplastics, that are settling out in the sediments, and that's what the crabs are, are sifting through um, constantly. Um, so, I, 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 it it could become a nu nutritional problem for them if they're, um, you know, they're they're uh, taking in a lot of a lot of plastics into their gut, which aren't uh, which aren't helping to feed them. Um, so be a very interesting study, yeah. Thank you, that one was asked by Christine. Um, next one, are there any invasive species in Southeast Queensland of crabs? Uh, no, I don't believe so. Um, there are, down, down south there are. Um, it's not impossible that there could be here. Um, but so far, so good. Um, 
that the Carcinus, the European shore crab, is 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 very common down in, in Victoria and in Tasmania, and it causes a lot of a lot of problems. Um, but yeah, no, Queensland's fairly safe at the moment. Um, this has been a big one that three different people have asked. Um, what are the main threats that climate change poses on two crabs, such as ocean, ocean acidification? <coughs> yes, well, ocean acidification is, is, is probably the, the biggest threat, um, as it is to uh, anything with a, with a calcium carbonate shell. Um, and particularly for the larval stages. Um, so because you've got all those fine, um, tiny little larvae floating around in the, in the sea, um, up to, you know, perhaps up to three, three weeks or a month before they, um, before they metamorphose into a, into a heavy bodied crab, um, then uh, they they would be very vulnerable to um, to to ash and acidification and uh, etching in the shell. In fact, it it was one of the historically, if you go back in time, um, what the when the di last dinosaurs were killed and the last big um, the last big um, extinction event, the end of the Cretaceous, a lot of things that had uh, that had um, calcium shells were, were wiped out and, uh, and and we had to get the, the sea chemistry back together before corals and, and crabs and, and what we the, the fauna that we marine fauna that we know today really got going again so um, it also with with the higher temperatures the, the water holds less oxygen as well um, so, yeah, it's, it's going to ca need careful watching. Okay. Um, are there any other uh, pending implica impl implications of climate change apart from ocean acidification, or is that just the main one? Um, well, uh, I touched on it in the talk. Um, sometimes things can, um, it can benefit things um, like, so you're getting, if you're getting uh, tropical things moving south, so you get just changes in distribution. Um, I, uh, I only recently identified the, this freshwater prawn that, that lives um, in tropical Australia. Um, and it, it, even though it's a native prawn to Australia, if it, if, it's now been found um, a lot further south than it was before. And the ecology of that area, um, if, it, if it keeps coming south, it's going to completely wreck the freshwater ecology of a, of a lot of our streams because they're not, they don't, uh, they've evolved without its presence. Um, so that could, could be the same for, um, for other species too, as as uh, as more northern species come south, the ecology will change, and and we don't know what what impact that's going to have. It's not going to be quick, I don't think, but it could be inevitable. Yeah, unfortunately, that that is true. Um, lucky last question, and I've been saving this one. Do you yourself eat crabs and? What is the best crab you would recommend? <laughs> I do eat crabs, but um, um, I uh, I prefer prawns and other crustaceans. It's a bit it's a bit nasty to eat my own. But then you know, I I have tried quite a few different ones, with some that I wish I hadn't, um, and. Um, Yes, a nice mud crab in a chili sauce is is, uh, is hard to beat. Yep. That's great. Thanks so much, Peter. Um, we had some really nice comments and thank yous coming in from people. Christine said, thank you so much for an interesting talk. 
Um, I did not know about the diversity and beauty of crafts and not have a much greater appreciation for that. So, and I definitely say in that. So thank you so much for your time, Peter. Um, and uh, we had one, one of our attendees ask whether you would be happy to share your PowerPoint presentation. Um, Lynn it's fantastic. So if that's possible, do you have an email address that Lynn can contact you on or audience, somebody from the audience can contact you on to get the PowerPoint presentation direct? Or do you want to email the team and I can pass it on? Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah. Please do. Yeah? Okay. Yep. Sounds good. All right, sounds good. Lynn, if you just um, email our uh, uh, Reef Check email address, which is seqevents at reefcheck.australia.org, so seq for Southeast Queensland, um, and then we'll um, pass on the presentation from Peter. Um, other than that, everybody sending their thanks on the chat box. We've had a few more questions in, but we'll... Um, Maybe send them by email and post them in our next newsletter at the end of it so people can get their answer or questions answered. Um, thank you so much for your time again, Peter. Um, we really appreciate it on behalf of all of ReefCheck. Um, Pablo, thank you so much for moderating questions. And uh, everybody else, I hope you had a, um, a great evening. And uh, um, thank you again for coming. Thanks for having me. Cheers.